So, have you heard the consultant joke? When I first came to Mongolia, I had a card and it said, Mark Watkins, consultant, until somebody came up to me and said, have you heard the consultant joke? So I'm going to tell you the consultant joke. Guy's driving out in the, uh, in the step in his uh, land cruiser, and he spots a herder, and, um, and the uh, herder is leading, and he comes over to the herder and he says, um, if I tell you how many sheep you have in your flock, will you give me one? Herder says, okay. So he takes out his laptop and his GPS and his, all of his equipment, and he uploads and downloads, and the link and the information is flying around the universe. And he says, you have 556 sheep in your flock. Herder says, you're right. He says, can I take one of the animals? Herder says, deal's a deal. Consultant picks up an animal, throws it in the back, and is about to drive off, and the herder says, wait a minute. If I tell you what you do for a living... Will you give me the animal back? The guy says, okay. He says, you're a consultant. How did you know I was a consultant? Well, first of all, I didn't ask you to come here. Second of all, you told me what I already know. And third of all, you took my dog. Now, the point of this story is that the herder that has a lot of knowledge. And if you take a look at traditional education, you see that here we have a mother and a child and the family going out and herding. What's happening here? This child is learning how to herd. And the child is learning, boy or girl, by doing, by experiencing. And this is traditional Mongolian education. Now, that's not the only kind of education that is delivered in Mongolia. You have here a classroom in Mongolia of children, and you notice they're sitting in rows, and they're all paying attention, and they're sitting there very quietly. Why? Well, this is a classroom around the turn of the 20th century. And people were going to school to learn how to do this, how to work in a factory, how to work in an office, and the education fit what the expectations were. Now, in both cases, in the case of the herder and the case of the early public education, the education was preparing students for a certain future. The herder child is going to grow up to be a herder. The city urban child is going to grow up to work in a factory and office. There was a certain future. And the thing that you wanted to avoid in this new industrial age was mistakes. Everybody had to do exactly what they were told. Today, however, that's not the case. What is the future going to be? We don't know. One thing we do know is that the future is unpredictable. And so the question is, how do we prepare young people to adapt and to be able to fit into and to adjust to a, an unpredictable future. Thomas Edison was, of course, one of the great inventors in the new industrial age. And what did he say? He said, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that it won't work. In other words, the mistakes are part of the success. And the education that would be appropriate during the new industrial age and now in the new information age is one that allows for and even encourages mistakes. That kind of education actually does that. The child is experiencing at his own ability or her own ability her, at her cognitive level, at her developmental level, she is learning how to herd. She's not getting a theory about herding. She's not learning that sheep and horses are all quadrupeds because they have four legs. She already knows that. 
This is the printing press. This is a, a, a picture of uh, Gutenberg's printing press. And the reason that I've brought it up is that it was this that caused the development of, educa of public education, one of the factors in, in, in creating public education, as well as the rise of industry. But what happened was, in the, from 1450 to, 15, to 1500, about 20 million books were published, in due, due in large part to the invention of the printing press. From 1500 to 1600, 200 million books were created. What does this mean? It means that knowledge was spreading, the amount of people, the audience was growing, but the effect of printing went far beyond the production of books, even beyond the creation of a larger and larger audience for that, even beyond the creation of universal literacy. The Protestant Reformation, which began in 1517, actually had a lot of encouragement because of printing. People could read what was going on. People became more literate. People had access to literature. So the, the effect of printing, the effect of this new delivery of information went way beyond the production of books. It went into education, into religion, into various forms of culture, into the industrialization of the world. And schools were created. This is Columbia University. This is a school in Scotland, in early, probably in the 19th century. Um, now the question is, we have the whole world at our fingertips. 99% of knowledge now is available to everybody, anywhere, virtually for free. What is the effect of that going to be on education? Let's take a look at education in, higher education in Mongolia. And let's look at the World Bank report of 2010. Now, I just want to read it because I want everybody to know exactly what the outside expert, the consultant, thinks about Mongolian higher education. Although this policy of encouraging private colleges to open has met the need for an increased supply of tertiary education, it has failed to produce graduates who can improve Mongolia's international competitiveness. The emerging problems are low cost and low quality education, a mismatch between the demand for and the supply of skills, and inequitable opportunities of access between the urban and rural areas and between the rich and the poor. The policy has triggered a downward spiral. There is thus an urgent need to reform the tertiary education subsector. And if I can go behind here and tell you, they made three basic um, proposals. One was to concentrate resources on fewer premier institutions, to use competitive funding to do that, and also to open the field to uh, higher education institutions, institutes outside of Mongolia to come into Mongolia and open schools. I don't think the World Bank went far enough because I think if we take a look at what has happened because of the internet, because of the digital revolution, we really need to look at higher education with no restrictions. So let's take a look. How will higher education change in Mongolia? I think we have to start from the very beginning. Now, I'm not going to be the consultant who is coming to Mongolia and telling people in higher education how they can change. I don't have the consultant card anymore. Once I heard that joke, I threw the cards away. So, but I think we have to ask, what is the purpose of education in a rapidly changing, unpredictable world? What did that education in the past do? Both forms of education, the traditional Mongolian education and the European-influenced ed education which came to Mongolia, that prepared kids for a certain future. We don't have that. The only thing that we're pretty sure about is, is that the future is unpredictable and unknowable. How do we... So what is the purpose of education? It's not to prepare kids to be herders anymore. It's not to prepare people to work in the offices. We don't know what their future is going to be. What kind of education? What is the purpose of it? The first question we should ask. Is it to deliver knowledge, skills, competencies, adaptability? Are we trying to, for example, 
help students develop their ability to learn when they're finished with school, when they're finished with higher education. Are they able to then continue to learn? Or when, when they gave me that master's degree, I said, I'm never going back to school. And that's the attitude that a lot of us have because the, the educational experience wasn't all that great, wasn't all that relevant, didn't prepare us. We have to ask, who are the students going to be? Who are the teachers going to be? Degrees, institutions. We have Columbia University, that picture you saw of Columbia University. I think that's the library. You know, here, well, my flash drive has, you know, information on it as big as many libraries. Do we need absolutely large, large libraries to offer secondary, uh, higher education? I don't think so. Where do we deliver this education? When? How? What methodologies do we use? Do we use methods that are closer to what the traditional Mongolian education is, which is experiential? Or do we use the method that we saw in the other uh, pictures? What do we learn? Where do we learn? How do we learn? Things like distance learning, lifelong learning. Let me ask you a question. So-and-so has a degree from Harvard University. That's great. So-and-so has a certificate from Bill Clinton University of Political Management. That seems pretty... Well, that's a new kind of way to deliver education. We think, well, if it comes from Harvard, it's good. But maybe if it comes from a very well-known person, who, who would you hire to teach judo in your school? The kid who has graduated from the physical education college? Or the kid who has graduated from, let's say, the new Tushinbayer Institute of Judo? Do we need those? The point is that the invention of the printing press, the spread of knowledge, didn't create one new way to deliver knowledge. It didn't even create one new way to deliver education. And what has happened now with the digital revolution, with the internet, is just the same kind of thing. The possibilities are now growing on ways to deliver education, on what education should be and how it should do it. And so, as I say in the last slide, Let's begin the discussion. And this is a very good place to begin the discussion because I think that almost everybody will agree that the education, higher education system in Mongolia now is not preparing our students for their futures. Thank you.